My name is Kenneth Jones. I'm from Riverside, California. I served uh, here for Dietrich. Overall, they numbered about 2,300 young men then, veterans of the U.S. Army's top secret Operation White Coat. This is the 30th year reunion, for most a celebration of pride in the sacrifices they made for their country. These were unusual soldiers, to say the least. They were all members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and they never fought in any battlefield. Their mission was to serve as human guinea pigs. You are in Fort Detrick, where some 600 military and civilian scientists work together in research to protect this country against a biological attack. Most white coats fought their war at Fort Detrick, Maryland. The enemies were dangerous and deadly viruses and bacteria administered by their own government. The purpose of the program was to help develop and test vaccines. Wendell Cole was exposed to the dangerous virus called Q fever. Are you proud of participating? Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna, when I check out, I'm going to have the American flag. I'm going to have a military funeral and all those other things they want to give you. I'm proud. Operation White Coat began in 1954 in the early years of the Cold War. The fear then was that Russia was ahead in the development of biological warfare. The U.S. was struggling to catch up using rats and monkeys. But animal responses do not always reflect those of humans. That's when the Army approached leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church whose members are called to adhere to a strict health code, no drinking or smoking, and they take the commandment, thou shalt not kill, quite literally. The church has always been engaged in medical missionary work and draws inspiration from the quote in the book of James, if you know to do good and you don't do it, that is wrong. There seemed to be a natural fit, so when the military came to the church and said, we're drafting a bunch of your guys, most of them are going into the medics, most of them are non-combatants. There's this ethos and ethic. It seems like a good test group to use. Richard Stenbecken was an army chaplain for almost 24 years, and he is now director of the church's chaplain ministries throughout the world. He says the church approved the plan because it was mutually beneficial and allowed members to worship on Saturday, their Sabbath. Sabbaths were free. Uh, they were making a contribution to humanity. They were in a uh, non-killing situation. Uh, it seemed to be, and I think was, a very good fit. There was a troubling ethical question the church had to come to grips with about members participating in tests that could be used for offensive weapons. If the Seventh-day Adventist Church leadership felt that there was any clear evidence that this material white coats were involved with was being used offensively, I, I think the church would have counseled its men against going into it. Could some of that data be used ultimately in another way? I can't answer that other than to say data is data, and how people use that data is their responsibility. There was one other unusual aspect to Operation White Coat. The volunteers were informed about the risks involved and required to sign a consent form. They could also leave the program whenever they wanted, and hardly anyone left, even those faced with exposure to the deadly tularemia bacteria, like Ed Lamb, who has no regrets. They briefed us so thoroughly. They were really careful right. about the preparation. And we would sit through meetings and spelled out in detail. And I really had no qualms about it. I was the first white coat to arrive in Fort Detrick to go through the eight ball. And I'm proud I had that opportunity. This 40-foot high steel sphere was a central experiment of the White Coat Project. It was called the eight ball. Here's what would happen. Scientists would fill the eight ball with a dangerous virus or bacteria aerosol. Volunteers wearing gas masks would hook up to the eight ball and breathe in the infected air. The White Coaters have much to be grateful for. None died, at least not during the testing period, which ended in 1973. What happened after is unclear, although the military recently sent out questionnaires to 1,000 volunteers and received responses from 522. This is Colonel Philip Pittman. We found that um, for the most part that there was no, we could find no adverse health effects from them having participated in uh, biomedical research. 
Colonel Pittman says the study did find an increase in the incidence of asthma and headaches among some volunteers, but it was a very limited study. Only 25 percent of the white coaters were surveyed, partly because the Army and the church have lost track of hundreds of volunteers. The military chose not to fund blood tests, which could have been far more definitive. A pitfall is that we do not know um, of all of the volunteers who have subsequently died, and thus we don't know what they died from. So we cannot evaluate uh, death and the cause of death. The survey apparently missed Gene Crosby, who can't get around without his wife, Rhonda. I asked him uh, about that, that Major Dangerfield, when I drank that stuff, if it was you know, going to last any longer than two weeks. Oh, no, it got the antidote. They're gonna, it'll be all over in two weeks, so. and it is isn't over yet today. Crosby served in 1964 to 1966. He's had two heart attacks, a stroke, and several other serious health problems. He has an autoimmune disease called ankylosing spondylitis. His brother was already a medic in Germany, letting him know that, okay, if you go to be a medic, you're going to jump out of a helicopter and be shot at. That's what the Viet Cong are shooting at. What would you take? A chance to stay stateside and alive or go jump out of a helicopter and be dead? Gene took the chance to stay alive. Gene is wishing now he took the chance on the helicopter. He was told three years ago that he would be dead within a year, but he is still fighting, this time against the Army, which he says has stonewalled his pleas for help. The couple has also left the Seventh-day Adventist, saying the church sold them out. Chaplain Stembecken said he was unfamiliar with the Crosby case. There is always the dangerous possibility of something going awry. But do you think that it would be the church's ethical responsibility to help him out? It needs to be multi-layered uh, because the responsibility is a shared responsibility. Almost everyone we spoke with is proud of their military service, although there were some who questioned the long-term medical and psychological support they received from both the Army and the church. They volunteered us. They, they, this was a bunch of Seventh-day Adventist kids. Lester Bartholomew and Gerald Lee both served between 1965 and 67. What kind of tests did you have? I had uh, rabbit fever, black plague, and tularemia. His temperature was up to 106. We had him in ice to get his temperature down. He didn't remember most of it. And Lester says he's had some lingering effects, though nothing serious. That's what I'm yeah. negative on, because uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, probably had one of the biggest medical organizations in the world at that time. And uh, there was no backup before we went in or no backup after we went in. And of course, the Army denied that we did anything when we were there. But the overwhelming sentiment here is that the testing, their sacrifices, made the U.S. a safer place. We now have inoculations against many of the diseases and viruses tested here. We have much more effective protective gear and a model of how to conduct human experiments with informed consent. It is the soldier, not the reporter, that's given us the freedom of the press. It's the soldier, not the poet, who's given us freedom of speech. And it is the white coats who have given so much that we have health, safety, and freedom. Thanks to the Lord, I'm alive. And glad to be part of White Coats and I do it all over again. It's been 30 years since the testing ended, and it's unlikely it will ever be repeated. But if there were a dire national emergency, it seems that most of these men would be proud to volunteer all over again. For Religion and Ethics News Weekly, I'm Lucky Severson in Frederick, Maryland.